My name is John Jacobson. I'm a radiologist at the University of Michigan working in the musculoskeletal division. My talk today will be musculoskeletal imaging. When is ultrasound enough? It turns out that ultrasound is being used more and more over the past decade. That's primarily due to the improved resolution of transducers. So with proper training, ultrasound can rival MRI. What I'm going to talk about are some indications where ultrasound can perform as equal as MRI. My name is John Jacobson and I'll be discussing musculoskeletal imaging, when is ultrasound enough? A few disclosures I need to mention. I'm a consultant for Sonocyte, Philips, Bioclinica, and Terrasan. I receive a book honorarium from Elsevier. So the objectives of this lecture are to demonstrate examples of musculoskeletal sonography, reviewing those applications that have been proven at least equal to MR imaging and include MR correlation when possible. Now, when one compares ultrasound to MRI, there are some advantages of ultrasound. For example, it's inexpensive, you can examine multiple joints, it's better tolerated by the patient, it's higher resolution than conventional MRI, you can guide needle aspiration, and it really is improved evaluation of the distal extremities. Keep in mind, however, that the deeper structures in the adult, such as the hip and the pelvis, are limited with regard to ultrasound evaluation. Now, there are some advantages of MRI over ultrasound. Of course, with MRI, you can examine the entire joint. You can look within the joint at the cartilage. You can look within the bone at all the deep structures. And one of the main areas, it's less operator dependent. So here's a list of accepted indications where ultrasound has been proven to be at least as effective as MRI. And I'll be going through these examples in this lecture. First, I'll be talking about tendon abnormalities. Now, if we look at the accuracy of ultrasound compared to MRI, there are several research articles which give us some promising results. Both rotator cuff, ultrasound, and MRI are fairly accurate at 87%. Looking at the tibialis posterior tendon in the ankle, ultrasound 93%, MRI at least 90%. Looking at perineal subluxation, ultrasound is 100%. The reason why MRI is questionable because many times subluxation is only present with specific foot placement or movement and therefore is not truly assessed in MRI. It's also been shown looking at ligaments that ultrasound can be quite effective. Now looking more closely at rotator cuff ultrasound, full thickness tears, accuracies can be approximately 96%. Partial thickness tears up to 94%. It's also been shown that it can be equal to MRI with regard to accuracy and size of tear. And again, patients prefer ultrasound over MRI. So there are plenty of advantages of ultrasound versus MRI. So how do we diagnose a rotator cuff tear? Well, most tears are hypochoic or anechoic, filling a defect within the tendon. As the tear becomes larger, the deltoid dips into the torn tendon gap. And at the end of the spectrum, a massive tear, there's non-visualization of the tendon. Keep in mind that there's an important indirect sign of a supraspinatus tear in patients over the age of 40, and that is cortical irregularity of the greater tuberosity. So here's the appearance of a normal supraspinatus. This is a long axis view where we see the hyperechoic and fibrillar or fiber-like architecture of normal tendon. Note that this normal appearance is best appreciated when the sound beam is perpendicular to the tendon fibers. As the tendon moves more oblique away from the sound beam, it becomes artifactually hypoechoic, which is called anisotropy. Note that on MRI, the goal is to look at each structure in long and short axis, and basically we duplicate that with ultrasound with this long axis view of the supraspinatus. Now, to correctly classify a rotator cuff tear or pathology, it's important to understand the anatomy of the rotator cuff. If we look more closely at the supraspinatus, there are three surfaces. There's the bursal surface, the articular surface, and the greater tuberosity. The extent of the abnormality and what surface it touches will determine how we categorize a rotator cuff tear. For example, looking at these illustrations, if we look here, this is a partial articular sided tear. The defect is in black. Note that it touches the articular surface also touching the greater tuberosity surface with bone irregularity. Note that it does not extend to the bursal surface, therefore we exclude full thickness tear. This type of tear is also called a rim rent tear. The example on the right is a partial thickness bursal sided tear. Again, the defect in black. Note that it's predominantly touching the bursal surface 
with some greater tuberosity extension with bone irregularity, but again, not going to the articular surface and therefore not a full thickness tear. Uncommonly, you can have a tear or a defect within the tendon or just touching the greater tuberosity surface. We use the term intrasubstance tear or interstitial tear in this situation. Note that because it does not touch the articular surface or the bursal surface, it will not be seen at either arthroscopy or bursoscopy. At the end of the spectrum, we have the full thickness tear where the defect obviously extends from the bursal to the articular surface. Note that there's retraction of the tendon. If the gap is filled with fluid, it would be anechoic. If the fluid is resorbed, you'd have dipping of deltoid muscle into this torn tendon gap. So here are some examples of this type of pathology. Here's an example of an articular sided partial thickness tear of the supraspinatus. The defect is well defined, it's hypoalkoic, it's touching the articular surface, there's bone irregularity. It's not touching the bursa, so it is not a full thickness tear, although it is an extensive articular sided partial tear. Note that on this T2 weighted image, that the ultrasound image is almost a mirror image where the pathology is bright on T2 and it's dark or black on ultrasound. Here's an example of a partial thickness tear involving the bursal surface. Here what we see is that the defect is involving the bursal aspect. It's touching the greater tuberosity. Note that it's filled with fluid and there's dipping of the deltoid and bursa into the torn tendon gap. Note that it does not extend to the articular surface therefore excluding a full thickness tear. In short axis, we can also see this defect, which is hypoechoic with bone irregularity. Incidentally, there is increased flow on color Doppler imaging. This should not be equated with inflammation. Many times this is neovascularity as the tendon defect is trying to heal itself. It is uncommon, however, to see increased flow within a tendon abnormality in the rotator cuff. As we look now to a full thickness tear, here we can see the end of the tendon is completely detached from the greater tuberosity. The defect is filled with anechoic fluid. This bright line here is called the cartilage interface sign where the fluid is touching the hyaline cartilage. Note that the normal convexity superiorly is now quite flattened because there is no tendon tissue there to keep that same contour and the deltoid and the bursa is really flattened out where the tendon used to reside. Here we have even a more extensive large full thickness tear where the tendon is really, we can't even see it, it's off view. Note the significant dipping of the deltoid into the torn tendon gap where the tendon used to reside. Note on the samurai image that there's muscle atrophy, the tendon's retracted underneath the acromion, and that's why we cannot see it, basically. It's because of the degree of retraction. So we talked about rotator cuff tears. Let's briefly talk about tendinosis, and this applies to any tendon throughout the body. We use the term tendinosis and not tendinitis because it's been shown that there are really no inflammatory cells after the abnormality has been present at least 14 days. Tendinosis typically is hypoechoic and may be focal or diffuse. Now one problem exists because sometimes a tear may not be anechoic but hypoechoic as well. So how do we differentiate tear from tendinosis? Well these are some guidelines that you may follow. The more anechoic, well-defined, and homogeneous the abnormality, the more likely it's a tear. The more hypoechoic, ill-defined, and heterogeneous, the more likely it's tendinosis. In the examples I showed, many of the tears had tendon thinning. That's a nice and direct sign. With tendinosis, the tendon may actually be swollen. Another important indirect sign is bone irregularity, as I mentioned earlier. If we see bone irregularity at the site of the hypoechoic defect, that would imply tear, but usually with tendinosis, the bone is relatively smooth. So here's a case of tendinosis of the supraspinatus tendon. Note the tendon is abnormal, it's hypoechoic, but note how it's really ill-defined. We cannot really trace the exact border of the abnormality, and we see tendon fibers traversing the abnormality throughout. Also note the tendon is swollen, and also note the smooth cortex, which would be different from what we would see with a tendon tear. Let's move on to talk about soft tissue infection and joint effusion, another indication where ultrasound can be quite effective. So how do we diagnose a joint effusion? While well, we're looking for distension of the joint recess, typically anechoic or hypoechoic. Be aware that if the fluid is complex, the echoes can be quite bright and be hyperechoic. Also keep in mind that ultrasound, including power and color Doppler imaging, cannot distinguish between septic and aseptic effusion. So if you're worried about infection, you must put a needle into the joint recess. 
Here's an example of an elbow effusion. It's been shown that the most sensitive place to look for fluid in the elbow is posteriorly with the elbow flexed. And here what we see is anechoic fluid in the lecranon recess, distending and displacing the fat pad posteriorly. Here's an MRI where we have fluid within the joint. It's T1 weighted where fluid is more intermediate. Note the bright fat pad which is pushed away because of the fluid in the lecranon fossa. A similar finding that we see in radiography where we have the sale sign and the fat pads displaced out of the joint recesses because of distension of the joint recess. Now keep in mind that if a joint recess is not anechoic but rather contains echoes, there's a differential. It could either be complex fluid or perhaps synovium. So how does one differentiate between these two? Well, these are the findings that suggest that it's a complex effusion. If you push it with the transducer and you see displacement, if you see the compressibility of the fluid, movement of echoes within, that all indicates complex fluid. Also, negative flow on color power Doppler imaging indicates that it's likely effusion. As I mentioned, swirling within the recess, that also implies that it's complex fluid. So here are two cases. The, the case on the left is synovitis. The case on the right is complex fluid. Here on the left, we see that the, that the posterior recess of the elbow is markedly distended. It's not anechoic, so it's not simple fluid. There are a number of echoes in here. This did not compress. There was no swirling. There was flow on color Doppler imaging, all indicating synovitis. On the right is an example of complex fluid with a septic joint. Here there are echoes as well within this recess, but in the real time we saw movement and swirling of the echoes, and this compressed with transducer pressure and joint movement. So looking more closely at synovitis, ultrasound and MRI have been compared in literature, although many studies are limited. It has been shown, however, that both ultrasound and MRI are more sensitive compared to radiography. Both can show activity of disease, ultrasound with the use of color and power Doppler imaging, and MRI with the use of gadolinium enhancement. An additional article has shown that ultrasound indeed is more sensitive compared to MRI. So here's a case of synovitis in the dorsal recesses of the wrist. Here's the radius, the lunate, and the capitate in long axis in the sagittal plane. We see hypochoic distension of the radiocarpal and midcarpal joint recesses. We can see with the color Doppler imaging, marked increased flow, these findings indicating synovitis. So if you see synovitis within a joint recess, the next thing we need to look for is the result of the synovitis, that being an erosion. So the cortex in the subcondral bone plate is normally smooth and echogenic with ultrasound. So to identify an erosion, we're looking for a disruption of the cortex seen in two planes, typically with adjacent synovitis. It has been shown that ultrasound is better than radiography in the detection of erosions. So here's a case of rheumatoid arthritis. Note the normal smooth cortex of the ulna now is quite irregular, and even throughout this whole area, very irregular. Now keep in mind that this irregularity, which in this case represents erosions, is quite nonspecific. Osteophytes at times can simulate erosions, and that's why we're looking for the adjacent hypochoic synovitis to indicate that this is truly an erosion. And here we see tenosynovitis of the extensor carpi ulnaris tendon. Another inflammatory condition you can see is bursitis, and what we're looking for is distension of a bursa, typically anechoic or hypoechoic. The key is to know where the various bursa in the body exist to differentiate a bursal fluid collection from a non-specific fluid collection. Now remember that just because the bursa is filled with fluid, it doesn't imply it's always inflamed. If you see hyperemia, or if there are symptoms with transducer pressure, that would indicate that the bursal fluid is truly inflamed. Of course, the more heterogeneous and the more synovitis within the bursa, again, the more likely it will be truly inflamed. Some etiologies for bursitis include infection, rheumatologic disorders, and gout. So here's a case of SLE with trochanteric bursitis. Over the greater trochanter, we see this area of abnormality in the expected location of a bursa. We see an anechoic area and a more hypoechoic area. Now with transducer pressure, Note that the fluid area is compressible with the synovial area is not. This will help when we're trying to put our needle into this area, we would target the fluid component and not the synovial component if we're injecting steroids into this inflamed bursa. So you can see how dynamic imaging can help differentiate synovitis from fluid based on compressibility. Moving on to soft tissue foreign bodies. This is one area where ultrasound really is preferable over MRI, primarily due to the high resolution of ultrasound. 
Fortunately, all foreign bodies look the same by ultrasound. They're initially hyperechoic. However, keep in mind that organic matter becomes less echogenic over time. Also, the foreign body will be more echogenic if you're perpendicular to the surface of the foreign body. And let me show what that looks like. So here's a, a splinter that's in the hand. Now, if we center over the puncture site, the foreign body is very difficult to see. But as we move the transducer around the finger, and we're now we're getting the foreign body more perpendicular to the sound beam, we now truly appreciate the hyperechoic nature of the foreign body. And there's a little bit of abscess formation around it. So if you're looking for a foreign body, don't just put the transducer over the puncture site, but interrogate the area at different angles so that we can catch the foreign body perpendicular to make it brighter. This effect here is basically an isotropy, similar to what we see with the tendon, meaning that if we're not perpendicular, the echoes actually decrease in the structure that we're imaging. So in addition to looking for the bright foreign body, we want to see what happens around it to help identify the foreign body. What we look for is a hypocoque halo surrounding the foreign body, which is a foreign body response with granulation tissue and inflammation. Also, there's often an artifact deep to the foreign body. If the foreign body is smooth and flat, we tend to see reverberation artifact deep to it. If it's irregular with a small radius of curvature, we tend to see shadowing. Here's an example of a rose thorn in the foot. I was interpreting this MRI. We did indeed see abnormal increased signal in this T2-weighted image, indicating fluid or inflammation. However, we did not see a foreign body. The patient returned for an ultrasound, and what we see here is this echogenic linear rose thorn with this halo around it, representing inflammation. Looking at the short axis of the foreign body, there it is, with a small abscess forming around it. It's unclear if this was the foreign body or this. Basically, the resolution of ultrasound is the key, which is the advantage for ultrasound in this situation. Let's move on to soft tissue mass. Now, ultrasound is primarily used in musculoskeletal imaging with regard to soft tissue masses to distinguish cyst versus solid. And where this comes into play is when a clinician suspects a benign cyst and then they simply want to confirm it. So we're going to look at Baker cyst and risk ganglia. So a Baker cyst is basically distension of the semimembranosus menogastrocnemius bursa, which resides in the posterior medial aspect of the knee. Over well, half the patients of 50 and eight, uh, years and older have communication between this bursa and the knee joint, and that's why we tend to see distension of this cyst in patients over the age of 50. And keep in mind that we must see this communication between the bursa and the joint between the semimembranosus and the metagastrocnemius tendons to exclude other fluid collections. So this is a very important finding, which I'll demonstrate on this slide here. So here's a typical Baker cyst. They tend to curve around the medial head of the gastrocnemius, but this is the channel here, the connection between the knee joint and the bursa that you must see between the semimembranosus and the medial head of the gastrocnemius. Now here's an MRI of the same patient. I've turned this upside down to simulate what we see on ultrasound. Here's the bursa, the Baker cyst. There's that channel or connection moving toward the knee joint. So if we see this, we know it's definitively a Baker cyst. So when someone has pain, other than looking for the presence of a Baker cyst, we need to look for a complication of a Baker cyst, that being rupture. Normally the Baker cyst is smooth at the bottom. If you see hypoechoic fluid tracking over the muscle of the medial head of the gastrocnemius, also shown on the MR, that in indicates that the Baker cyst has ruptured, and this can cause significant pain and swelling down to the ankle, and at times simulate uh, venous thrombosis. So the other mass or cyst that we look at with ultrasound commonly is the wrist ganglion. Now most wrist masses are ganglion cysts. 70% occur over the scaphoid ligament. The rest occur between the radial artery and the flexor carpi radialis tendon. So these are two very important areas to screen for ganglion cysts when you're imaging the wrist with ultrasound or even MRI. So by ultrasound, you'll see anechoic or hypoechoic cyst or mass like area. It tends to be well-defined. Another important finding, it tends to be lobular, almost a multiple lobules or vesicular, and that's a very important indirect sign. You may see joint or tendon sheath communication. Keep in mind that when they're small, they won't be anechoic, so they don't fulfill the criteria for a simple cyst, but that's because they have, they're composed of small vesicles rather than a large single fluid collection. So here's a typical dorsal ganglion cyst over the scaphoid ligament area. Note in the MRI, we appreciate the fascicular, the multilobular appearance, and this is classic 
we see the same thing by ultrasound with these septations and lobularity. This is the scaphoid bone on this image on the right. Now, if you look at the volar aspect of the wrist, again, they tend to occur around the radial artery. Here we can see one between the radial artery and the flexor carpi radialis. They tend to come from the wrist joint. And as you can see on this ultrasound image, they can wrap around the radial artery and they can simulate a pseudoaneurysm. Let's move to the next accepted indication, that being peripheral nerves. This is one area of my practice that has dramatically increased over the last four years. Again, that's predominantly due to the higher resolution probes that can really show the intrinsic anatomy of a peripheral nerve. So a peripheral nerve will actually show the individual hypochoic nerve fascicles, and you'll see surrounding hyperchoic connective tissue. If you look at the peripheral nerve in transverse, it has a honeycomb appearance. So here we're looking at the median nerve in the carpal tunnel. Here's the flexor carpi radialis. Here's the pulmonaris longus. There's the retinoculum. So as I rock the transducer along the long axis of these structures, we can appreciate the hypoechoic individual nerve fascicles and the bright connective tissue surrounding it. That's the median nerve. Note that the tendons actually become dark, and that's due to anisotropy. That's one trick to differentiate a tendon from a peripheral nerve. So we predominantly look at peripheral nerves with ultrasound to evaluate for entrapment. And the ultrasound findings of nerve entrapment are the same regardless of where in the body we're looking. So basically, as a peripheral nerve goes into a tight space, typically a fibrosseous canal, we'll see swelling of the nerve. And this is usually best appreciated transverse to the nerve. Moving proximal to distal, you'll see swelling. The nerve may also be hypoechoic because of edema, especially the connective tissue layers. Then as it goes into the entrapment site, there's variable enlargement or flattening. So the most common entrapment neuropathy is carpal tunnel syndrome. And there are different ways of diagnosing this by ultrasound. This described in 2009 is a very effective way where they measure the median nerve more proximal or the pronator quadratus looking distally in the carpal tunnel. If the nerve area increases by two millimeters or more, that indicates carpal tunnel syndrome with 99% sensitivity and 100% specificity. Also note the significant hypochoke edema of this enlarged median nerve. Here's a companion case. Again, contrasting with the normal appearance, the median nerve is enlarged and it's globally hypochoic because the individual connective tissue bright areas are now hypoechoic corresponding to significant increased signal on the T2-weighted image on this MRI. We can also look for cubital tunnel syndrome, again looking for enlargement. One study has shown that if it's greater than 9.5 millimeters square in area in cross-section, that's abnormal. There are a number of causes for the ulnar nerve to be swollen in the elbow. It could be from overuse, an adjacent joint process, or a normal variation muscle called the enconius epitrochlearis. So here's a cross-section of the ulnar nerve within the cubital tunnel. The cubital tunnel is enclosed because of the arcuate ligament, the humeral head, and the ulnar head of the flexor carpi ulmaris. This is markedly enlarged and hypochoic. If we look in long axis, you can see the nerve is enlarged, markedly enlarged and hypochoic at the cubital tunnel entrance, and then there's a transition to more normal size within the cubital tunnel. So this is a finding of entrapment that we see. And if you push on this area at the transducer, the patient will experience symptoms and give you that immediate feedback. Another peripheral nerve pathology that we look with ultrasound is Morton's neuroma. Now, unlike the, nerve impl the name implies, neuroma is not a tumor, but it's really edema, fibrosis, and necrosis due to digital nerve entrapment. In this situation, the nerve will be enlarged, more than 5 millimeters, will be hypoechoic, and ultrasound is quite effective in this diagnosis with 100% sensitivity. It's important when you see this hypochoic mass between the metatarsal heads in the foot that you look for the digital nerve to go into the mass, which excludes other causes for mass in this area. So here between the metatarsal heads, we see an enlarged hypochoic area that's over a centimeter, and here it is on MRI, and this is a Morton's neuroma, again, classically between the metatarsal heads. If we look under long axis, we can see this mass-like area again, and there's the edematous peripheral nerve going into this area of nerve entrapment. Another important indirect sign is when you push on this with the transducer, with your hand on the other side of the foot, the palpation and pressure will cause significant symptoms 
experienced by pushing on the Morton's neuroma. Now, more recently, the Mulder's maneuver has been described. Now, the Mulder's sign is a clinical sign that when you squeeze the foot from side to side, there will be a popping sensation and pain where the Morton's neuroma pops in and out from between the metatarsal heads. We can do this with ultrasound, and here we see the metatarsal heads, and we're going to look here for the Morton's neuroma. It's located here right now, but as we squeeze the foot from side to side, there will be a click, and the Morton's neuroma will snap out. So here we can see the Morton's neuroma snapping into, into view. This is the plantar aspect of the foot. This is the normal intermetastarsal space, which does not demonstrate this finding. And with this maneuver, the patient experiences symptoms, which again is more indirect evidence. The next area is dynamic imaging. Now this is one area where ultrasound really is effective, effective compared to MRI, and that is because the patient has pain or symptoms in a certain joint movement or position that's difficult to recreate in the magnet, but that's easy to do with ultrasound. We can look at a number of structures that show pathology with dynamic maneuvers. We can look at dislocation of the biceps, subluxation of the triceps, snapping of the iliopsoas, the perineal, and we can use this to help differentiate partial from full thickness Achilles tendon tears. We can move the shoulder and look for bursal impingement, uh, we can put stress across the elbow and look for ulnar collateral ligament tear. For nerves, you can look for dislocation of the ulnar nerve. We already showed Morton's neuroma. And then inguinal hernias and muscle hernias, again, using dynamic imaging is imperative in making these diagnoses. So just to show a couple examples, here's an example of snapping iliopsoas uh, tendon syndrome. Here's a transverse oblique view over the anterior hip. Here's the ilium. There's the muscle. And there's the tendon. Now normally when the patient goes from frog leg view to a straight view, there's a smooth motion of the muscle and tendon. If you're snapping or popping, if that is seen, that implies it's abnormal. Let me start the video clip. Right now we're in frog leg position. As the leg is straightened, keep an eye on the tendon. And there's the snap. So basically it's moving abruptly. It's snapping down onto the ilium. You can feel the snap through the transducer. Sometimes you can hear the snap the patient will tell you, yes, I'm feeling pain when this maneuver is happening. So all this feedback together gives you the diagnosis. There it is again, of snapping hip syndrome. So here's an example of muscle hernia. This is a patient who had ankle pain. We scanned her ankle and it was completely normal. At the end of the exam, I asked, well, could you point to where the problem is? And she said, when I stand up and move my foot around, I see a mass or a bulge. So we had the patient stand up and do a specific maneuver that created that symptom. And what we saw was this bulging of the muscle because of the weakened fascia, this representing a muscle hernia. Now, while we were scanning, the patient explained that she was feeling some uh, symptoms going down her leg. And what we saw, in addition to the hernia, was this hypochoic swelling of the superficial perineal nerve. So ultrasound with dynamic imaging allowed us to make the muscle hernia diagnosis, the resolution of ultrasound allowed us to see the superficial perineal nerve entrapment, which coexisted with the muscle hernia. Another cause of elbow pain where dynamic imaging is very helpful is snapping tricep syndrome. Normally, the ulnar nerve in the tricep stays behind the medial epicondyle when you go from extension to flexion. In some people, especially those with large muscle bulk, if you flex the elbow, the ulnar nerve can dislocate and part of the medial head of the triceps will subluxate as well. Note, first of all, how enlarged this ulnar nerve is. So there's already evidence for neuritis. As we flex the elbow, the nerve comes out and look at the medial head of the triceps. Both of these are abnormally moving medial and anterior to the medial epicondyle, causing the patient's symptoms. And this only occurs when the patient is flexed. Here's a, an MRI of the same patient with the elbow extended, Indeed, we can see some edema in the ulnar nerve, although this can be a normal variation. We have no clue to why there's a problem here because in neutral position, we do not see the dislocation of the ulnar nerve, and we do not appreciate subluxation of the medial head of the triceps muscle. So the last area where ultrasound can always be considered is when the patient can have MR. There are a number of situations where this comes into play, perhaps when a patient has metal formed bodies near critical organs or certain ferromagnetic devices or implants, some people just don't like being the magnet because of claustrophobia, and some people just can't fit in the magnet. So in these situations, 
we need another alternative, and that's where ultrasound can be quite helpful. So just to summarize, what I tried to accomplish is to review some accepted indications where ultrasound can perform equal to at least MRI. Tendon abnormalities, by far the most common indication, that being the shoulder rotator cuff ultrasound. Soft tissue infection and joint effusion, form bodies, and again here, because of the high resolution, it really is the imaging method of choice. Soft tissue masses, cyst versus solid, that being Baker's cyst and risk ganglion. Peripheral nerves, again, because of resolution, allows us to really appreciate all the entrapment neuropathies. Also, with ultrasound, we can examine the entire extremity in a fraction of the time that MRI would examine an extremity. Dynamic imaging, definitely one area where ultrasound performs much better than MRI, and I showed a number of examples of that. And lastly, when there are contraindications for MRI. One last point to keep in mind, the accuracies of ultrasound and MRI really depend on the education and the training of the person doing the ultrasound. So as I mentioned, in all these indications, ultrasound can perform equal if not better than MRI, but that also depends on the training and experience of the person performing the ultrasound. Thank you very much.